How did Colby Covington end up an American top team initially? Uh, we were looking to increase the, uh, the wrestling presence at our gym and up our level and came up with an idea to go out and reach out to some guys who recently graduated, some high level wrestlers from college. And we basically went to Flow Wrestling and put out some, some feelers saying that we would bring guys down and house them for a couple of years and teach them MMA, you know, if, if they met our credentials. So we actually set up a tryout. And he was one of the guys that sent in an application and he came down and tried out and it didn't take us long to see that he had a lot of potential. So we invited him down and he took, took us up on the offer and that's how he ended up here. How soon into Colby's time at American Top Team did he and Jorge Maz all start to develop a relationship? Pretty much from day one. You know, they just somehow or another were attracted to each other. Maybe opposites attract, but uh, they struck up a friendship pretty quick. George took him under his wing and George was already a veteran. And uh, I guess they realized that Colby could up George's wrestling and George could up Colby's striking. So they hit it off pretty good. What was that relationship like? Like when, when you see them at the gym, were they always together? How, how, did that, how did that work out? I mean, they were just always together, always talking about each other, but propping each other up. You know, it was always, oh, this guy's gonna do this and this guy's gonna do this. We're gonna take over the world together. It's like, okay. So it was, it was apparent to everyone at the gym that those two guys were, they were, they were thick as thieves, those two. Yeah, the, 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 those guys were legit tight. Uh, there was a, there was a, a fight that, that Colby had in Singapore, and I believe you went out to that fight. And uh, I was talking to Andre about this. I think he was on that card as well. And, and not, a, not a lot of ATT people went to that fight, but Jorge <laughs> flew all the way to Singapore, I believe, to either corner Colby or, or give Colby support. What, are the, what does that say about, about you know, who Jorge is as a, as a teammate? I mean, outside of Kayla Harrison's comments and assertions that she's the captain of the team, I mean, George has been around almost since day one here. Everybody looks up to George, and, and not just because George has accomplished a lot and is a successful fighter and ventured into other businesses and gotten successful. I mean, he's, he's like the alpha here in the gym that everybody looks up to and everybody wants to be like, but in large part because of what he gives back to the team. George is always there for people on the team. I mean, if George won the title on, day, on a Saturday night and someone needed him on a Monday morning for, for a camp, he would be here. So it's, it's, I'm not surprised by anything George does to help his teammates out, put a look out for the team. He's, he's just a team guy. What would you say their friendship was like, I guess, then in, in the gym, outside of like, you know, them crap talking each other, like uh, they were also main sparring partners, right? They were, they were primary sparring partners for each other inside the gym, back at their apartment. I mean, there's, I saw videos online of those guys training in there, just who can get the takedown, you know, who can do what. They, they were just always together. They were always training. They went out and probably did a little partying on the side, uh, knowing George. But those guys were, were really tight. Where you saw George, you saw Colby. What would you, uh, or I guess, how would you describe Colby Covington as a person going back then to those early days when he was at ATT, when he was hanging out with Masvidal? How would you describe him? Colby was pretty quiet. You know, George kind of brought Colby out of his shell a little bit because um, George is obviously an extroverted type guy. Uh, but Colby was... Fairly shy and very quiet, fairly quiet back in the day when he first got here. The, uh, the, the fight that I mentioned in Singapore, I think also has other significance as well, if I'm not mistaken. That was, I believe, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, take me through this. That was also the card where I think Sean Shelby told you guys that Colby might get cut if he doesn't start to change what he's doing a little bit. Can you tell me that story? Yeah, I mean, Colby was a little bit of a problem for the UFC. It's kind of like that John Fitch issue. You know, he's a guy who was going to beat just about everybody that he fights, but his style was, was not very exciting at the time. And case in point, he was fighting Stun Gun in Singapore, who was, you know, obviously the favorite of the crowd. And he went out and basically 30 26 them, blanket them. The crowd's booing the whole time, which from a crowd over there is fairly rare. They're typically a pretty respectful crowd over there, but it was not a very eventful fight. And after the fight, Sean came up to me and just basically said, hey, man, he's got one fight left on his, on his contract. And he's beating guys we want to promote. And fans aren't getting into him. So if you want to start looking for something else for him to do after his next fight, go ahead because we're not going to re-sign him. So that's obviously a, a red flag. And I'm sure that obviously Colby Covington does not want to get cut by the UFC. I think he was like 7-1 and one or something at that point. He was obviously very successful. How, how did he start to change 
his persona? Like, how, was, that, was that you coming to him? Was that a discussion that you guys had? How did that all come together? I went right to him in the locker room that night right after I talked to Sean and said, uh, hey, man, here's, here's what Sean told me. You know, obviously, we're not going to be able to change things overnight with the way you fight. Your style is your style. But there's other things you might be able to change. And uh, I asked Sean if he could fight Damian Maia next in Brazil, and he said yes. So why don't we talk about it? And then when did he, and, and maybe you had some input in this as well, when and how did he start to kind of change that, that style outside the cage, that persona? Uh, that was a, that was a wake-up call. That was a, a slap to the face from Sean. So pretty much that night, he started thinking, what can I do to set myself apart? What can we do to make me different? What can I do to get some attention? And what he did his next fight with Damian Maya obviously worked cause, because he went from being cut or not re-signed after that fight to getting an interim title shot in his very next uh, fight. So after that fight, of course, he you know cuts a pro wrestling style promo in the cage after beating Maya. Impressive victory over Maya, by the way. And he kind of runs down Brazil. He runs down Brazilians. And that was kind of the first time that we saw this this new version of Colby Covington. But I think I think already, and correct me if I'm wrong, there were there were people that were rubbed the wrong way, I think immediately, especially Brazilians at American Top Team, right? Can you t- tell me about that situation? Oh yeah, we we had blowback immediately at the gym from some of those comments and you know, Colby never really caused much of a problem for other fighters at the gym leading up to that point. Um, and we obviously obviously have a Brazilian presence at our gym with some other fighters and some coaches. And I think most of them saw it for exactly what it was, just him trying to promote himself. But it's not just how you see things in this business. You know, these guys are opening up their Instagram accounts and they're getting direct messages, you know, from a million people in Brazil saying, what are you doing? You piece of you're going to train this guy. You're going to work with this guy. You better step up and, you know, represent our country. What are you doing? So they felt pressured. So, you know, basically we just had a meeting at the gym and set everybody down and said, hey, man, this is American top team here. I don't care where you're from or who you are. You know, when you're inside this gym, you're here to do do your job and, and we're a team. So if anybody has an issue outside of the gym or something somebody's doing outside of the gym, that's fine. But it stays outside the gym, not not inside the gym. And, and nobody's too big to, to be asked to leave this gym and nobody's too small to be respected inside the gym. So that's just the way we run our team. And I think everybody bought into it and everybody understood it at the it's, time. It seemed like, uh, it seemed like at that point things did, had stabilized, right? After that, you had that conversation. Things were things kind of got back to normal pretty quickly at the gym, right? Yeah, we, we quashed that real immediately at the gym. I basically said, you know, Colby might say Brazil's a dump and you guys might think Colby's an asshole and you might both be right. But the fact of the matter is when you're in the gym, you're in the gym and we're here to do a job. When would you say... Because, you know, Colby and, and Jorge are very close at this point. I think even even then for that fight with Maya in Brazil, they were still best friends, good friends. When would you say the tension started? And do you remember what it was that kind of started things off between the two of them? Yeah, there was an issue with a coach. Uh, Paulinho is a boxing coach. He's been around forever. He works out of Miami. He's friends with, with George since day one. Works with Andre Arlovsky. Works with a couple of our other fighters. But he's a freelancer. Um, welcome at our gym anytime, great guy. And a dispute came out about Colby working with him because through George and not paying him after a fight. And uh, George took it the wrong way. George got involved and I guess some words were exchanged. And from that point forward, there was there was some heat between those two. This was, uh, I think, all happening around the time where Colby was fighting for the interim welterweight title against Rafael Dos Anjos, that fight in Chicago, 2018. And I remember Colby saying some things, too, about that week in Chicago. He's going for the title. Uh, George is supposed to be in his corner. And George doesn't get there until, like, Friday night or maybe even Saturday. He gets there late in the week. Doesn't help Colby cut weight. And Colby's upset by this. Do you remember that, that situation? Can you tell me about that? I actually believe the dispute with the coach came out of that fight with Dos Anjos. Based on how much money Colby made from that fight, the coach was supposed to get paid X, according to George, and, and got paid Y. Um, I didn't really insert myself into the issue because it's not one of my coaches. He's outside the gym. You guys are men. Handle it yourselves. Um, I was at that fight with Dos Anjos. I don't remember any dispute between George and Colby. I remember them being pretty damn happy before, during, and after that fight. So I can't really speak to any of that. So maybe that was something that Colby said after the fact that, that bothered him about, you know, what, what George did, that he, you know, didn't come up, didn't come to help him cut weight and all that stuff. I don't, I don't really know. I, I believe probably none of what I hear and half of what I see these days, especially with those guys. 
So the, the issue with the coach uh, with Paulino Hernandez happens, and uh, that's when the tension starts. When did, uh, when did the tension kind of start to manifest itself inside the gym, would you say, where other people could also notice it? Well, the, the lead up to the Dos Anjos fight with Colby was all about Brazil. And that was the angle Colby took. That is what got him to that promised land of getting a title shot, saved his job. And it was it was over pretty big, you know. It was it was a big issue, so it was basically 100% of Colby's attention in promoting himself for that fight was against Brazil. Um, as soon as that rivalry ended after that fight, and his next fight wasn't going to be against the Brazilian, Colby then took it upon himself to branch out and go after literally everybody in the business, regardless of your gender, <laughs> what division you were in, um, people inside the gym. And then when it got to people inside the gym, George became one of his first targets, and, and then it escalated pretty damn quickly. When, when Colby started to talk about George in that way, you know, trash talk him on, on Twitter and in interviews, were they already estranged at that point, or were they, were they still friends, would you say? You know, George is not a real difficult guy to figure out. You, you know which side of the fence George stands on. If he's on your side of the fence, he's going to be there to the death. He'll jump in the, in the way of that bullet to help you out. That's just the way he is. Um, but if he's on the other side of the fence, you know he's on the other side of the fence. And, and he's not your friend, and he never will be. And once that issue came up with his coach, George is extremely loyal to his coaches. As soon as that issue popped up, I think George was on the other side of that fence from Colby. So when Colby started attacking George in social media and whatnot after the Sanyos fight, I think George had already decided he was going to be on their side of the fence, and he didn't need much gasoline on that fire before he was going to shoot back. I think, um, at least publicly, their their beef started to come out. I think, I want to say, probably during uh, Colby's training camp for the Robbie Lawler fight. Um, another guy who obviously, you know, uh, was an American top team, you know, veteran and alum. Do you, do you recall that? Do you recall that, those situations where, you know, things were kind of, the tension was increasing and, you know, th these guys are both still at this gym. Uh, was it, was it weird? Was it, was it difficult? Was it, was it, uh, you know, tense to have them both here at the same time? Yeah, I recall it really well. I mean, it, it, it went from zero to a hundred pretty, pretty damn quickly. Um, you know, Colby had some issues talking about other people in the team and Joanna he had problems talking about Dustin Poirier. He had problems talking about George and it got to the point where, you know, at first it was like, Hey guys, shut the up inside the gym, stay away from each other. And then it got to the point where many people are upset with Colby. And now I've got to worry about who's going to be in the gym at the same time. And is Colby going to cross paths with George? And is there going to be a fight? Is Colby going to cross paths with Dustin? Is there going to be a fight? And you can go to people and say, hey, don't make our lives more difficult in the gym than it already is having 100 pro fighters here you know, with a hundred interests that may not be in line with some of the other people on the team, but you know, you're going to exploit this and you're going to make this a big problem for everybody. And you're going to bring the overall level of the gym down. So, you know, it, it went from the point where I thought I could handle it just by talking to everybody individually and collectively. And then it got to the point where we couldn't do it. So we made an ultimatum at the gym and said, unless you have a bout agreement where you're going to fight somebody on this team, shut the up about that person. Don't say anything about that person, you know? And when you see people in the gym, if you guys aren't training partners, if you're not friends, great, you walk the other way. But I don't want to have to have extra coaches on, on duty at times to, to shadow you guys to make sure a fight doesn't break out. I don't want to have to go schedule training sessions at separate times of the day worrying about that. That's just, we don't need it at our gym. At this point, are you, are you talking to those guys individually, George and Colby? And if so, like, what are those conversations like? What are you saying to them? I'm trying to tell these guys that running a gym in and of itself is a difficult task. You know, there's a million things that happen that we need to worry about. And, you know, we have a little bit of an advantage over some other teams that haven't been around as long as we have because we've just made a lot more mistakes than other gyms have over the years. And we've learned from those mistakes. So I like to think we have an advantage in experience over some of the competition, but it's a very slim advantage in that regard because everybody's good these days. The sport has evolved so much. But what they're now doing is taking away our advantage and creating distractions for us that are now going to give advantages to other teams over us because we're spending parts of our day worrying about like this instead of how to make our fighters better and win fights. So don't put us at a disadvantage with respect to other gyms. 
you know, try to put the team, not ask you to put the gym first over yourself because this is an individual sport, but don't create problems for the team, which are then going to trickle down to our coaches and fighters, which is going to put us at a disadvantage. I know there were some uh, incidents that happened between the two of them, uh, uh, firstly, George and Colby. How close did that get to being physical when, when those guys were in the gym together? Because I know that, you know, it got, it got pretty heated. Oh, it got really heated in the gym. We had people have to pull them apart to, to stop something from, from getting really ugly really quick in the gym. And, and that was the point in time where I said, you know, this, you know, I just, we can't have this distraction at our gym. Here's the rules, here's our guidelines. If you can't follow them, think back to that meeting where I said nobody's too big to be asked to leave the gym. You know, five years from now, you guys aren't going to be here anyway in all likelihood, and the gym's going to go on for the next 30 or at least as long as I'm alive. So I'm going to put the team first on this one, and if you guys can't go by our rules, I'm going to ask you to leave. There was also an incident that Colby had with Joanna. Uh, I don't know if you were here for that, but do you remember what happened and, and you know, what, what kind of transpired between the two of them? I remember a lot of talk back and forth between Joanna and Colby, and you know, it wasn't something that I'm worried about spilling into a big altercation at the gym and people throwing down, obviously. But again, it's just another distraction. You know, it's just something we don't need. And I remember talking to Colby saying, why are you talking at people that you're never going to fight? That is not the way to draw money and attention to yourself. Instead of talking about Joanna or Dustin or Fabricio Verdum, why don't you talk about somebody that you're actually going to fight and build to a fight that people can pay money to see that you can then ask for more money from the UFC to compete in. Is, is that where you say like the, like, uh, because everything that Colby was doing was effective, right? And, you know, in, in its own way, it was getting him more opportunities and it was, you know, getting him title shots and making him more money. But do you think at some point that he it kind of like uh, got out of control, like he crossed the line a little bit with, with stuff like that, with the Joanna, you know, uh, you know, trash talk against, against someone who's he's never going to fight? I think if Colby had stuck to his original script all over the country from the guy that you're fighting, um, support Donald Trump and, and, and piss off 50 or 51 percent of the country, I think if he had stuck to that script, he would have been more effective than on everybody in the world. You know, I mean, why are you getting into arguments with John Jones online? You're never going to fight John Jones other than maybe backstage which is going to do none of you any good because you're not going to get paid to fight backstage. You know, you want to, you want to spoil a Star Wars ending. That's cool. That'll piss off some nerds. That's great. You know, but, but why are you people that you're not going to fight? And on top of that, why are you now putting yourself ahead of our gym? You know, people in the gym that you're not lined up to fight and creating distractions for us and putting us at a disadvantage when it comes to running our team effectively. So 2020 happens, and I believe pretty early in the year you put in this this uh, this new rule of the team where no more trash talking teammates, no more trash talking anyone else in the American Top Team. Is that right? What obviously I think we know why you put that rule in, but why did you put that rule in? Yeah, we we set up a rule just because we kind of reached the end of our rope. You know, I'm spending half of my time in the gym dealing with issues between fighters or coaches coming to me saying, "God damn, how am I going to deal with this? I've got this going on and this going on." You know, I got to schedule these guys separate. This is really creating the distractions. So I just said at one point, you know, screw it. Here's our rules. Live by them. Get the f out. And that rule was broken pretty quickly. Yeah, I think, I think that rule lasted maybe a couple of days before George and Colby both jumped right over the line and, and jumped right back into it. On Twitter, right? I think it was Twitter and stuff. I think it was somewhere on social media. That's how people communicate these days. And then what did you do? Um, literally read the article, got it some type of alert that, uh, that it came out and, uh, just took it, exited out of the social media site that it popped on, went right to my text, sent a group text to George and Colby and said, you know, I liked you guys a hell of a lot better when you were broke and cared about the team instead of just yourselves. Neither one of you can come back get the out of the gym. I hope you end up fighting each other and beating the living out of each other. So you threw them both out. They were they were done at that yeah, point. Yeah, picked them both out. And then what happened next? Because, you know, obviously now George is still at ATT. Colby is not. So what happened next? Um, basically got an, a, res, a response from Colby immediately on a text that said, hey, man, you know, I understand your position. I get it. Totally appreciate everything you did for us. 
And, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll do what you want. No problem. Got a phone call from George a minute after that. That basically said, hey, f you, dude, you can't kick me off of that team. I, I've been there longer than anybody. I'm like third in line to take that team over when a couple of you guys die. You can't kick me out of your team. I'll be there tomorrow. And uh, kind of went back and forth with him a few times and told him, no, man, this is it's just what we got to do. You know, sorry, there's there's nothing we can do about it. And, you know, every couple of days over the next couple of months, I get a call from George. Hey, man, when am I coming back to train? When am I coming back to train? And uh, maybe like a month or so after that, I sent a text to my kids about something. And one of my kids or two of my kids responded, hey, sorry, made a deal with George. Promised him I wouldn't talk to you anymore until he was allowed back at the gym. And uh, I kind of tapped out and eventually realized I was just never getting rid of this guy. <laughs> How long was he actually kicked out, would you say? I think he was gone probably two or three months. Wow. You know, Mike Brown, you know, called me up one day. He's like, man, you know, what am I going to do with George? He's going to have to fight. Can I, what am I doing? I, I can't not train George. I said, man, you want to drive down an hour and a half to South Miami and, and train George at night after you're done here? I don't care. Knock yourself out. And then I start getting calls at midnight, you know, three days a week saying, I'm driving home from Miami after training Masvidal. If I got to be awake and out of my sky, I'm going to with you too. And you're going to talk to me the whole way home. And, you know, it almost, it almost turned into an inside joke. You know, it's, it's, it, it was hard to ever picture George not being part of this team just because he's been around for so long and been through so much here. Um, but, you know, you, you got to put the team first sometimes. And... Uh, Eventually, it just kind of just kind of worked itself out where he came back to the team and, and Colby knew that Colby wasn't coming back to his team. It wasn't good for us and it wasn't good for him. You know, he need, he's better off being in a small place, you know, doing his own thing. He's just, he's just not made for being at a big gym considering his choice of how he pr promotes himself. Was that the last time you actually spoke to Colby? Um, probably texted him a couple times back and forth after that. But, yeah, I, I don't communicate with Colby anymore. You were Col Colby's manager, too, at one point, right? I was. Yeah, I managed Colby for a while. And when did that relationship end? At the time he left. Uh, actually, I stopped managing Colby shortly before the Lawler fight, but was kind of co-managing him, where the, the guy that came in to help him and made him some promises was calling me for some help, and Colby was asking me for some help, so it was... Kind of went from being like his manager to like a co-manager type type relationship, which, you know, there's a lot of guys on our gym that, you know, I don't manage, but they come to me for help and, and, and I help out from time to time. So it was kind of that situation. How do you how do you feel about that whole thing now when you look back on it? Like, you know, does it upset you thinking about it? And you just kind of chalk it up to this happens at big gyms like this? How do you feel about it? 25 years into this, really, nothing really surprises me about the directions go. I can't really expect fighters to put the gym before themselves, but I really don't expect a fighter to put himself so far ahead of the gym that he's going to put the gym in a bad spot. So I look back, I'm a little pissed off at, at the way some of it went down, but at the end of the day, we have 100 pro fighters here to focus on. We're going to focus on things that make our gym better, and we're going to learn from things that happened at our gym, and maybe next time something like that comes up, comes to fruition at our gym or we start sniffing some of that out maybe we'll live we'll learn from some of those experiences and handle it a little differently maybe we could have avoided it you know if if we did things a little differently but i don't know it's just, it is what it is how do you feel about colby covington now um that's probably the camera you know i i don't really hate colby covington you know there, there, I, I hate the way he put himself ahead of our gym and caused problems for me. You know, other than that, I see him fight guys that aren't from this gym. I find myself rooting for him. You know, see him fighting somebody from our gym. I'm rooting for him to die just like I root for everybody that fights somebody from our gym. Um, if I saw Colby walking out of the hallway right now, I'd probably give him a fist bump and keep on walking. What are, you, what are your emotions like going into this fight? Because it's, it's a very personal one. And it's one that, you know, you, you've literally been here for all the buildup to this fight, you know, from the time that they were friends to the time where, you know, they had a split to now. So 
what are your emotions like? Are they are they increased more than a regular fight would be? Oh yeah, I'd be lying if I said this is just another fight. We got fights every week, and this is no different than any of them. I mean, this is a this is a monstrous fight. I mean, you're talking about two of the best fighters in the world. I mean, if you take the number one pound for pound fighter in the world out of the equation, Kamaru Usman, Colby hasn't lost a fight since 2015, and Masvidal hasn't lost a fight since 2017. So these are this is a high stakes fight between two guys that are at the upper echelon of the sport. So in and of itself, this is a huge fight for us. You throw the personal side into it, and, and it's a monstrous fight. And you know, I, I, I can't help but look to what, it, what a fight like this means to the individual at our gym. I mean, this is a big fight. You know, George wins this fight, his career goes a certain way. George loses this fight, it's gonna go another way. Same thing from Colby's perspective. So yeah, I'd be lying if I didn't say this is a big one. I almost feel like this is fun. this fight is like you can throw the rankings out, you can throw you know title implications out, you can throw you know legacy out. This is a deeply personal fight, and both guys almost almost probably feel like they need to win, right? Would you would you agree with that? I was sitting home watching the Whitaker out of Sonya show, and they threw a teaser up for this fight, and I was just like, wow, Holy you know this this is a big fight. And uh, forget rankings, forget titles. I won't be surprised if this is the biggest pay-per-view show they do this year. I mean, this is a fight that is real. This fight has huge implications for both guys. And there's just so much heat and hatred right there for this fight. It's, uh, yeah, this is, this is a big fight. I mean, this is, a real, this is a real grudge match. I mean, it's not a title fight. It's still a pay-per-view headliner because of that deep-seated you know, hatred. I mean, is it a hatred, would you say, between the two guys? I don't think you'll ever find a fight going backwards or forwards where two guys know each other better than these guys, have trained with each other more, and hate each other more. You know, and, and I don't know if it's those personal feelings affecting their judgment or the way they're looking at things, but they both think this is going to be an easy fight. They literally both think they're going to go in there and beat the living out of the other guy. And I think they're both dead wrong on that because they're both fighting as good a fighter as they will ever fight. Last thing, American Top Team is, uh, you know, it's one of the top teams in the world. It has tons of pro fighters, tons of UFC fighters. But some of the storylines kind of always go back to stuff like this, the drama between Horry and Colby. How, how frustrating is that for you that people talk about that more than the overall success of the team? I mean, I'm a pro wrestling nerd. You know, I, I'd rather have a fight as a fan with huge buildup and a big grudge than two guys that are just really high level guys that come out and shake hands and respect each other. I just, I just think it adds something to the fight. So, you know, I'm not really frustrated by the buildup and you know, what people are focusing on this fight. I think it adds a lot of gas to the fire. And I think people want to see two guys come out that really hate each other and really want to beat the out of each other. I mean, this isn't a tennis match, it's a fight. Best outcome at UFC 272 for American top team, would you say? The best outcome for us would be uh, Masvidal Askren, too. Five-second knockout? That would be pretty, uh, that'd be pretty satisfying for a lot of people at this gym. Does that seem realistic, though, against someone as good as Colby? Uh, it didn't really seem realistic against somebody as good as Ben Askren, but uh, I think Colby's a, a whole other level than that. I mean, outside of Usman, I think Colby's going to be favored against anybody that he fights. So, yeah, it's probably an unrealistic expectation to have a short fight like that. But I think it's also an unrealistic expectation for someone to think that Kobe's just going to come in there and dominate George. I think this is going to be a, a really close fight and a really good fight. Is the whole gym kind of feeling this, like feeling this, uh, this build up? Because they were, they were all here, too, when this stuff was going on. And now it's actually going to you know, come to a culmination. Everybody in this gym, I don't care where they're from, who they fight for, what language they speak. Everybody in this gym is vested in this fight. Thanks for watching ESPN on YouTube. For live streaming sports and premium content, subscribe to ESPN+.